Gold, silver, palladium? Oh my! Gold surges as a safe haven asset. We dig into the right metal to buy for safety. Activism in U.S. ENPs. Some call U.S. oil companies uninvestable. We talk to one activist trying to fix the problem. The fate of U.S. LNG exports. I sit down with Jill Ivanko, CEO of Chart Industries, to see which projects will get built and which ones won't as natural gas prices sink below $2. I'm Alex Steele. Welcome to Bloomberg Commodities Edge. 30 minutes focus on the companies, the physical assets, and the trading behind the hottest commodities with the smartest voices in the business. And today, it's commodities on edge, caught in an unrelenting slump as the spread of the coronavirus is seen hurting growth and crushing demand. Here's your snapshot. Oil entering a bear market down more than 20 percent this year, breaking below 50, putting cash flow for U.S. oil stocks at stake. And copper sending out its own warning signs. Inventories are at the highest level in a year and a half. And prices flirt with correction territory. And risk off is safety on for gold. Prices at a seven-year high. Goldman says they could rally to 1,800 in just three months. So all this week, Bloomberg spoke with mining CEOs to get their take on how the virus is affecting their business. Everybody's on edge uh, and, and, and taking this very seriously and the uncertainty around it. We have Chinese shareholders. I suppose we'll be careful in going to China under these conditions. From a mining standpoint, we know that from past history, when China implements stimulus package, it's pretty intense from a commodity standpoint. Yes. And it could be a very good piece. Why do you think the places that we operate in are pretty protected at this stage from, from the virus? We thankfully operate in top tier jurisdictions. So. Canada, the US, Mexico, all through South America and Australia, we're not seeing any impact operationally. It doesn't change how we're running our business. Joining me now is Suki Cooper, a Standard Charter Bank Precious Metals Analyst. Suki, good to see you. Do you buy gold here? We think that there'll be opportunities to continue to add to long exposure. You might see a little bit of a sell-off, so there might be better entry levels. But beyond that, we think that upside risk still lingers for gold. Are we looking at like 1800 like Goldman says, is it 2000? Like we're going to have that conversation again like we had in 2009? <laughs> We see a lot of macro factors turning increasingly supportive for gold. We see that the U.S. Treasuries are likely to fall further. We expect 10-year uh, yields to fall to 1.1 at the end of Q2. So we were initially forecasting gold to hit highs of 1,700, but we think that the risks now lie to the upside. What about positioning? Like, how long are investors currently? Like, how much of its portfolio does it encompass now versus, say, 10, 15 years ago? As in, how much more catch-up can we get? This is really fascinating. If we divide uh, the investor groups up, we can see tactical positioning. Gross longs are at all-time highs. ETP mm. holdings came off a little bit yesterday, but still at all-time highs. But it's a retail demand that still continues to lag. So although we've seen some positioning at uh, record levels, we still think there's scope for further upside. Yeah, and that blue line is sort of where we are in the net futures positioning. You can see how extended it really is. Um, the other metal that's really been on a tear, and not just recently, is palladium. Is that a safe haven or is that a totally different kind of scenario? We see the palladium dynamics unfolding very much linked to its own fundamentals. Mine supply is struggling to grow. We've seen continued um, strong demand from the auto catalyst side. And stocks are running low as well. If you look at ETF holdings, they've fallen over the past five years, leaving less of a buffer mm -hmm. for the palladium market. So we see re the palladium story very much driven by its fundamentals. And we think that the auto demand still remains healthy, even given the production impact in China. Uh, what kind of price level do you think we can get to? And is there one where we all of a sudden see some kind of metal switching, say, in the car industry? That's a great question because we've already seen prices elevated and at such levels where economically you could perhaps see switching between platinum and palladium. But despite this, there are so many other factors that are at play that are driving this decision, whether it's focus on alternative fuel vehicles, mm. but the greater focus is really on compliance. Auto companies want to make sure that their auto catalysts are compliant with the strict standards and that has been much more important than where price levels are. How can we get? How far can we get? Palladium prices at the, this stage, it looks like it can still run a little bit higher. Mm. It's difficult to say where that top is because the market is still hugely undersupplied. We're forecasting a deficit in excess of a million ounces this year, and we think next year we could continue to see that deficit persist. So given a top is quite difficult, but we still think that the market is very, very tight. So let's, add, let's finish up here with silver because silver is in a really tough spot, industrial metal and a precious metal, and hasn't really rallied as much as gold has. Does it play catch-up or not? 
We think that silver has benefited on the safe haven demand that we've seen in gold, but its own complex, its own story is a little bit weaker. The industrial demand has been a bit softer, mm -hmm. given the semiconductor shipments, given the photovoltaic industry as well. So we haven't seen that jump in terms of industrial demand supporting silver. So we still think that you'll see some investor interest in silver, but not to the extent that we're seeing it in gold. Really appreciate it. So great to catch up with you, Suki Cooper of Standard Chartered Bank. And as we head to break now, you got gas prices in LA are surging after a fire erupted following an explosion at a Marathon Petroleum refinery in Los Angeles. Southern California gasoline prices jumped the most in seven weeks after the blast as the region is isolated from the bulk of US oil refining system. Unbelievable pictures there. This is Bloomberg. I'm Alex Steele. This is Bloomberg Commodities Edge. Time now for the data dig where we delve deep into the market trends of the week. First up, oil inventory numbers rose actually by 452,000 barrels. That was much less than anticipated, but we did see some kind of build in Pad 3 as well as Cushing. The markets, though, completely ignored the number because they're really swept up in those virus fears. And talk about virus fears, chicken is now piling up. Nearly 1 billion pounds of chicken are now sitting in American warehouses, the most ever for the month of January. And there now is a record stash in steel in China. The world's largest steel industry just sent out another warning flare. The demand for rebar, which is used in construction, has wilted, and the holdings are now at a record, as many of those construction projects are now on hold. All right, now let's get into the ring. The activist investor versus U.S. ENPs. The oil price crash dragged down oil stocks. The energy sector now, just waiting in the S&P, is on the verge of dropping below utilities for the first time Ever. Equities are down 23% already in 2020. Joining me now is activist investor Ben Dell, Kimridge Managing Partner. Ben, good to see you. Good to see you. So uh, how bad does it get for energy stocks? Well, I think the energy sector has to change its business strategy. If it continues the way it's been going, we've already had a lost decade, uh, as you pointed out from the charts. And the sector is at risk of doing the same thing again, unless that actually changes the way it runs the business. So at this point, like regardless of, of the activism, which we will get to, can these companies have any cash flow to cover their dividend at 47, 46? Like what's the super pain threshold? Well, I think below $50 a barrel, it's very hard to find any economic wells being drilled in the US. There may be individual ones, but certainly from a company standpoint, no company is returning their cost of capital today at this commodity price environment. And if you take a look at this chart, it shows sort of the, the XOP versus the S&P and how much they've underperformed just in the last year. If you go back further, it's even worse. Um, what do you suggest they do to fix it if you have an oil price at 47, 46? Sure. I mean, look, fundamentally, this business doesn't have a cash generation problem. It has a cash use problem. You know, all of these EMP companies are taking their cash, they're borrowing money at 9%, 10% cost of capital, and they're reinvesting it in the ground and generating a 1% to 2% return on capital employed. That's fundamentally unsustainable. Our view is the sector's got to start returning cash to shareholders. It's got to lower its reinvestment rate towards 60, 70 percent, closer to where the S&P average is, and it's got to return that cash to shareholders. If you can return the enterprise value of a company within 10 years in dividends, then you should see people come back to this sector. And this is sort of like your playbook of what you should wind up doing. And I guess at 47, 46 dollars, even if a company was interested in talking to you, could they really execute? It's definitely hard. There's definitely costs you have to cut. You have to become more disciplined on the wells you're drilling. You have to high grade your portfolio, lower your SGNA. But it is possible if you have the highest quality rock. Realistically, the names we're looking at are names at the front end of the cost curve, in the best basins, with the best rocks. There's a large portion of this industry that's unsustainable and can't make the economics work. And frankly, that portion of the industry just has to go away. Is there an oil price on the up or downside where this thesis of yours you think holds less ability to execute? Well, what we've seen from previous campaigns is if the commodity price rallies, management teams become less inclined to change. They say they're changing that behavior now. They do. And look, we've seen incremental steps. We've seen people talk about paying dividends. But you're talking about a 1, 1.5% 1 dividend yield. We're talking about companies paying 10%, 12% dividend yields, returning 100% of the enterprise value within a decade. Then the optionality on the long-term outlook for commodity, investors are willing to take that risk. Mm -hmm. But that's what they need to do to bring investors back to the sector. And we saw it in refining and tobacco. So tell me more about that. Well, I think if you look at the refining sector, people believe there was no growth in U.S. gasoline consumption, and that thesis is held true. 
When you look at it, the U.S. refiners said we're going to stop reinvesting in new capacity and cokers and new expansions, and we're going to take our cash and return it back to shareholders. And it's been one of the better performing sectors in energy, and it's outperformed the S&P. So then when you take that model and then look at us and look at the energy stocks, where are you going to start? Like you're smart, the small companies, like do you go into for the bigger companies and try and be more of an activist there? Like what's your strategy? Well, the interesting thing in the sector is a lot more names have become, you know, within the range of names that we could go after because of the drop in market caps. The reality is we don't want over leveraged names. If you have leverage of more than two, two and a half times EBITDA, it's very difficult to change anything within that business model. Just ask Chesapeake. We, yeah, yeah, we want companies with high quality assets at the front end of the cost curve with bloated SGNA. But look, the reality is 80% of the industry has these issues, and it's going to take a long time to change it, but there's a lot of targets to go after. Now, you mentioned sort of how much they wind up reinvesting. Now, someone would say, well, they have to reinvest that much because they have to wind up producing uh, more oil to offset the decline rates in the existing oil fields. They have to do that. And I know that if you look at the other sectors within the S&P, they outspend much more. But what's wrong with that argument? Well, look, fundamentally, if I borrow money at 10% from a bank and I took it and invested in U.S. Treasuries and earned 1%, most people would stop giving me money. But that's been the EMP business for the last decade. What we're saying is if you have a portfolio, you shouldn't model your portfolio on trying to hold production flat. You should look at your wells, decide which ones actually make a return, and only invest in those wells. And the truth is, for a number of these companies, that'll mean production declines. It may be a modest decline, it may be a steep decline, but that you return the excess cash to shareholders. There's EMPs now trading at two and a half times EBITDA, where the most economical thing they can do is stop drilling and just return all the cash back to shareholders. Can you give me an example of a company that you've done this with that works or that you're looking at or the type of company? Well, look, a great example is PDC in our previous campaign, which unfortunately we were unsuccessful for. When you look at PDC, they merged with SRC. They've cut costs, I would argue, not nearly enough on the SGNA side. They're still running around 200 million. They've started to generate free cash flow. Last night, the company's talking about a 12% free cash flow yield. But the critical problem with the company is that free cash flow yield is not turning into a dividend to investors. Mm. And the risk investors have is that the existing management team will take that cash and just buy something else, which has been the industry problem. And at $47, $46, that really hurts. All right, uh, thank you so much, Ben. Great to see you, Ben Dell of Cambridge. Thanks for joining us. All right, time now for the note of the week. We're focusing on the commodity sell-off, and it comes to us from Colin Hart of BNP Paribas Asset Management. He says that for industrial metals and energy, I think we're going to get to levels where we will move to marginally overweight from neutral, but we're not there yet. He does think we need another 5 to 10% sell-off for us to get to that point. Well, coming up, Jill Ivanko, Chart Industries President and CEO, uh, will be joining me. Her take on the LNG industry. This is coming up next on Bloomberg Commodities Edge. I'm Alex Steele. This is Bloomberg Commodities Edge. Time now for the BNF Brief, which gives you in-depth analysis on clean energy, advanced transport, commodities, and emerging technologies. So one other commodity disrupted by the coronavirus is natural gas. And Bloomberg NEF says Chinese LNG imports could drop 3.1 percent this year to 59 million tons. Joining me now with more insight, Noreen Malik, a Bloomberg Energy reporter. Noreen, the ripple effects of that are huge, because then you have more LNG on the market. Prices globally are slipping. What are you noticing in terms of contracts, in terms of what companies are saying? Right now, it seems like a lot of companies are trying to put an optimistic face, especially in the U.S. Yesterday, Chenier held their earnings call, and they got a lot of questions about it. And they kept verifying or confirming that their contracts are solid. It's very difficult to declare a force majeure, which you see on pipelines in the U.S. They said that's not the norm um, in the global LNG market. And they're trying to, like, sow some seeds of optimism by saying that the low prices are spurring some new demand growth from places like India. They mentioned that in Southeast Asia, um, they're foregoing some, L some gas production domestically to buy cheap LNG. Mm. But, I mean, that is the big concern. We're going into spring, winter's almost over. Like, are we gonna see more deferred cargoes or contract or cargoes being canceled outright? Right, so we saw that in the case of Spain. Uh, one buyer canceled some cargoes. Is that like they're never gonna take those cargoes or they just delayed it? Like how, what does that mean? 
they canceled it. So they're not going to take them. We don't know if there's any additional like background negotiation going on with mm -hmm. it. This is a long-term customer with Chenier. So they're on the hook for additional cargoes. And um, that's still on the table. Yeah, exactly. So then let's go to India because you broke a story about Petronet uh, maybe trying to renegotiate or look for other suppliers than Tellurian uh, for their LNG. What's that about? Yeah, so Tellurian always said that they're going to negotiate through the end of March, but because of Trump's visit to India, there was a lot of anticipation in some areas by investors that they would maybe sign a deal, like that would create pressure. Because that happened in mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. late last year where, during the Howdy Modi event in Houston where they actually signed that MOU. So now what's happened is they've decided to extend that potential negotiation, negotiating period um, through the end of May. Which would have, I'm sure, effects on the contract and then pricing and, and global uh, it, pricings. It definitely kicks the ball down the court and mm -hmm. so then it raises the question, well, this is a massive deal. Is it going to get done? What volume is going to get done? And when are they actually going to break ground? So those are all the big questions out there. All right, Noreen, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Noreen Malik joining us there. And that sets us up perfectly for Commodity in Chief. We're going to focus on one executive in the commodity world. And today it's Jill Ivanko from Chart Industries. So first, a closer look at her company. The U.S. exports a lot of natural gas. The first terminal opened in Louisiana in 2016, and since then it's become the world's third largest natural gas supplier, sending LNG as close as Europe and as far as Japan. Most everyone believes natural gas demand will grow. The question is how fast, how much, and who the players will be. Here's the situation. 157 million tons worth of LNG liquefaction projects are on the drawing board in the U.S. About 90 million tons worth of global projects reached final investment decision in 2019. The problem? Natural gas prices are around $2 MMBTU. For those terminals up and running, no problem. It may even mean more demand from price-conscious buyers. For those waiting to make their final investment decisions, trying to raise capital, or working on long-term contracts, the economics hurt. Export terminal hopefuls need to sign long-term big deals now for a project that will take years to build. If they can't, the world runs the risk of being short the export capacity right when demand needs it the most. And this problem hurts everyone, from producers to exporters to industrials to oil service companies. Well, Chart Industries recently reported earnings with a record $760 million backlog and confident that some of their big projects will receive that final investment decision. I caught up with Jill Ivanko, the CEO, and asked her about the state of the market. Most of our customers have been at this for a long period of time, so it's been iterative over the years. And while it's kind of more of a long ball game, in particular on the LNG side of things, uh, so a quarter, six months, where an investor might think that matters, it actually, uh, from our situation, doesn't matter because these are three, four-year projects to mm -hmm. construct. So uh, we think it's going to happen, and it's been happening over the last couple of years to get to final investment decision on some of the bigger projects. Do you think that all the FID in the U.S. gets done? No. <laughs> well, well, tell me why. Um, I think that we've seen kind of the first cycle take longer than what had originally been thought back from 2012, 2014. Some of the first cycle projects are even coming online now. Um, so I think this is going to happen where um, there's higher confidence projects right now that have more funding for whatever reason, and those projects are going to move forward, and some of the smaller projects that haven't been able to get traditional offtake are going to be the ones that drop off. How many more waves do you see? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's um, certainly a third wave. So some of the projects that maybe don't FID in 2020 uh, take a few more years, and we see those come online as that uh, demand kind of increases and catches up to supply. Um, we also are seeing a lot around some of the small-scale LNG projects, some of the global infrastructure build-out. So as that matures, I think we'll see more demand for uh, U.S. supply. And that's where you kind of get the benefit of low natural gas prices, right? So the lack of a, the not going projects forward because of $2 natural gas is the bad thing, but the good side is the demand. So what kind of demand increase have you noticed, and like how does that play into your business? So for us, we're more capital equipment suppliers, mm -hmm. and uh, we certainly would love all the projects to move forward. And what we're seeing is the low natural gas price is creating a little more parity with other alternative fuels. Where are you starting to see the demand come up a little bit? 
Uh, we're starting to see it in uh, trailers, in uh, tanks for bunkering, in regas terminals, in particular in countries like Indonesia and in countries like India, um, certainly where there's a need for power uh, generation and traditional sources are creating deaths around um, not clean air mm -hmm. in Beijing is a good example. Could you talk a little bit about the different types of terminals that will be built later, like in an import side, like the, the large ones versus the small ones, like what kind of, we, what are we going to see in the future versus today? Right. So we've actually already seen an evolution from what was used to be baseload terminals. There's still some of those, but we're really seeing an evolution to mid-scale in terms of export. And that's around innovation and around becoming more efficient so you can deliver cheaper LNG. Uh, we're starting to see the move toward um, what I would consider more small-scale, micro-scale, mm -hmm. where you're serving a remote community and you're able to generate gas locally and serve that community in more of a hub-and-spoke style model. Um, and I think what we're going to see moving forward in the next 7, 10, 12 years, so a much longer kind of time frame, is going to be around being able to take that gas, whether it's imported or uh, created locally, and distribute that into various locations. Where can you be more productive and be more efficient? So there's multiple areas you can do that. Um, what we're seeing a little bit is the modular and the standardization side of things. Mm -hmm. So we offer equipment as well as process technology. Ours is called IPSMR, which is Integrated Pre-Cooled Single Mixed Refrigerant. <laughs> Cool. It's Account catchy. Accountant yeah. came up with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what's happening is it allows for more efficient production. Mm -hmm. um, it allows for less upfront capital cost. And then you're able to, over the course of time, add various different componentry to that process technology, which will continue to drive brownfield sites um, costs down. And so that's where uh, the future is going, is around how to innovate, whether it's a greenfield or mm -hmm. a brownfield site. How do you take what you have and get more gas? How do you, what, what, what does that do in terms of reducing costs? Like how much cost can you bring out as an example for something like that? So compared to a traditional baseload facility, um, our process technology on a mid-scale cuts the upfront capital cost by 50%. That was Jill Ivanko, Chart Industries CEO. And since taping, as we were just talking about, Chenier said on its earning call it was struggling to sign long-term contracts because of the market turmoil, while Venture Global actually entered into a 20-year supply deal with EDF. And China has some of their ducks in a row. As you see in this cell phone video, an army of 1,000... 100,000 ducks are being deployed to Pakistan to fight a swarm of crop-eating pests that threaten regional food security. So according to scientists, the ducks are biological weapons that are more effective than pesticides and can eat more than 200 locusts a day. Ah, okay, here's what's on my commodity radar. Uh, Wednesday, you got Chevron's analyst meeting, and I'll be speaking uh, to Mike Worth, Chevron's CEO, on Tuesday right ahead of that meeting. And Thursday, OPEC's ministerial meeting really kicks off, and Exxon holds its own investor day. And Friday, OPEC Plus meets to rubber stamp Thursday's decision. That wraps it up for Bloomberg Commodities Edge. This is Bloomberg.